Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending ACAM's webinar, Introduction to Epigenetic Methylation, presented by Ryan Smith. Attendees are encouraged to submit questions using the Q&A box below, and your questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Before we introduce everyone, I want to briefly mention a couple of ACAM events we have coming up. We will be hosting a live virtual advanced chelation training on August 21st. And we're very excited to have Dr. Anna Navas Ossian and Dr. Judy Nahosa join the excellent list of faculty presenting in that event. We are also finalizing the details for our upcoming annual meeting, which will be held virtually on November 5th and 6th. Now moderating it for us today will be Dr. Avi Herskowitz. Dr. Herskowitz is the president of ACAM and an international leader and educator in the field of personalized precision and integrative medicine. His academic background is in cardiology, immunology, autoimmunity, and virology. His most recent academic position was as a clinical professor of medicine at UC San Francisco. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Herskowitz. Please take it away. Although, thank you, um, Daniel. I wanna thank first the ACAM team and all the participants joining us today. And I also wanna thank uh, an old friend, Ryan Smith, for doing the webinar today and give a brief background. As background, Brian, Ryan, sorry, graduated with a degree in biochemistry and then went on to do multiple research internships and focused on large scale protein synthesis and physical chemistry. After graduating, he attended medical school at the University of Kentucky for two years and then made the decision to leave and work in the pharmaceutics field focused on peptide synthesis and formulation development for pharmaceutical preparations. So most of us know Ryan from his previous position as vice president of business development at, at Taylor Made Compounding, which was the first and largest compounding pharmacy working on a broad array of peptides in the United States. And since then he opened a True Diagnostics, which is um, about one year ago. And that's a company focused on this exciting technology of methylation array based diagnostics for uh, life extension and preventive healthcare, I can say that this is exciting technology that is in its infancy. And uh, I'm excited to personally participate by uh, ordering the test and using it on my patients and say that it's, it is an affordable test, number one, and it's also often leads to actionable results. So Ryan is a great speaker and I'm sure you'll enjoy his outstanding webinar. So Ryan, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Herskowitz. I appreciate you having me and uh, I appreciate uh, spending more time with ACAM. I love the organization and I'm really excited today to talk about epigenetic methylation um, in clinical medicine, but particularly in longevity-based medicine. Um, and, and so still very, very thankful um, and would love to go ahead and get started. Again, thanks everyone for coming. We got a lot of ground to cover today um, as it relates to epigenetics. And so what I really want to do is sort of outline what we're hoping to do today, which is sort of talk about what is methylation and then talk about how it's being used now clinically and how it might be able to affect you or your patients. Um, in addition to that, we'll talk about some of what we expect to exist in the future and then often talk about sort of aging as a disease and how this can be a great quantifying measurement for aging. Um, and so I always sort of like to start with this quote by uh, a great uh, Silicon Valley MD PhD researcher who says that from five to 10 years from now, the health data system that doesn't use epigenetic data to improve the medical delivery is going to be deemed archaic. Uh, and I think that to, to give a comparison, I think that where we're at right now with epigenetic methylation is where we were a little over 30 years ago with, with sort of DNA analysis. And, and so this is a rapidly growing field as Dr. Herskowitz said it's still in its infancy, uh, but there's still a lot of really interesting things that we can learn from these biomarkers, um, especially as we start to consider how to best treat patients um, in, in clinical fashion. And so uh, we'll start with a really basic description about what is epigenetics. And, and the way that I typically like to explain this to patients or, or anyone who's uneducated in, in the field of genetics and epigenetics in this multi-ohm is that every cell in the body has the exact same DNA. But obviously every cell has very, very different phenotypes by which DNA is expressed. So some genes are turned off in some cells, some genes are turned on in other cells. And the epigenetics are a way that we actually mitigate those effects in terms of what genes are expressed from that baseline infrastructure of DNA. Um, and so DNA methylation is typically thought of silencing, whereas histone modification is typically thought as activation or acetylation, which sort of starts to transcribe a lot of those genes. And then you also have non-coding RNA, which is you know probably a little 
little bit less uh, relevant to our topic today, but, but those are the types of DNA modifications that sort of make up this epigenetic field. And, and epigenetics literally stands for above the genome or what's sort of happening right above the genome to, to mitigate some of these transcription factors. And, and we can get really complicated in talking about some of these different changes. There, there are now a lot of molecular diagnostics to actually look at this. And that's actually been one of the biggest problems and why this is such a big sort of uh, emphasis now and so exciting now is that the techniques developed from a biochemical molecular biology standpoint, I should say, are, are getting sophisticated enough that we can really look at data in a much more organized and a much cheaper fashion, just like it took, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to sequence the first genome. Now that we have new sophisticated molecular biology techniques, being able to quantify effectively these different epigenetic changes in cells is now doable. Um, and so this is why it's sort of now becoming such a, a really exciting point of clinical practice, because it's really looking at what is happening in the DNA on an individual basis instead of just looking at the infrastructure of DNA like you would do with traditional DNA testing, which just tells you what can happen. With DNA methylation, we're lo really looking at what is actually happening in each of those genes. And, and so whenever we talk about G DNA methylation, there are a few terms which are also very, very helpful. One term that you might hear me say often is this term CPG island. Um, and, and these are the locations in the promoter regions of genes that have cytosine and guanine nucleotides. Usually several of these are the promoter regions of genes. And generally what happens here is when there's a methyl group attached to these locations, particularly to the cytosines on these locations, what happens is gene transcription is silenced. So the genes that, that are sort of available in your DNA are not transcribed and then coded into RNA. Um, and so it sort of starts as an inactivation of these genes. And, and these CPG islands are almost always found in the promoter region of genes, although they are separated at many, many places throughout the genome. Additionally, methylation is, is really, really unique to mammals in the fact that, that as a baseline, the majority of our genes are actually going to be methylated uh, to start with. And, and a lot of the processes we think of uh, to be uniquely mammalian um, are also uh, coded by this. Uh, things like genomic imprinting, um, things like how bees know exactly who the, the queen bee is, or how dolphins know how to swim uh, when they're first born. Those are genomic imprinting, which is actually passed down via epigenetic uh, sort of hereditary genetics. And so this is really, really interesting stuff uh, as we start to sort of tease out what genetic changes and what genetic imprinting changes are related to epigenetics. And so uh, you will hear me say CPG Island many, many times uh, throughout this lecture. And that is sort of the precise description, sort of where we're looking at the DNA to see if or if it's not methylated, and therefore if or if it's not transcribed. Um, and so the actual process that, that happens is these cytosines become methylated uh, by using these DNA methyltransferase enzymes. And, and they actually use a lot of these cofactors like acetylmethionine um, and acetyl homocysteine in order to do that. And so oftentimes people, when we talk about DNA methylation, might also think of methylation statuses like MTHFR genes. And, and if you might have a predisposed to high homocysteine levels, or if you need to supplement with folic acid or, or SAMe or some of those other methylation factors. This is a different process but, but it, it is happening via a similar biochemistry. And so they are related and we'll talk about that, but really in terms of a clinical application, they're not super relevant. So I definitely wanna draw a distinction between those two processes. In addition to DNA methylation, uh, we also can talk about DNA acetylation. And this is the opposite of methylation, where methylation will turn off these genes. Acetylation, uh, you know, these acetyl molecules are actually charged molecules. And whenever they're put onto these histone proteins, what happens is that these positive charge actually push open a conformational change, which sort of opens up these proteins to be uh, accessible by transcription factors, which allows these genes to be transcribed. And so the majority of epigenetics are really split between methylation and acetylation. And unfortunately, at the moment, acetylation is a little bit more expensive and not as robust of a testing protocol. So the majority of things that we'll talk about today um, and what we found from an epigenetic clinical literature standpoint mostly has to do with methylation. However, methylation is a really, really broad platform. There are over 26 million spots in your DNA where you can become methylated. Um, and that's quite a bit, especially as you consider that every cell has a different epigenetic profile. And so, so this is a lot of data. 
we're talking about a lot of data. And just like things like cholesterol, you know, when they first discovered cholesterol as a biomarker in the blood, they didn't necessarily know that it was linked to things like heart disease. Um, and it's the same with methylation. As we begin to, to create these data sets, one of the things we're looking at is the correlation to outcomes. Um, and in order to do that, we're not just having breakthroughs in, in the sort of the molecular biology diagnostics by which we look at these methylation values. We're also having really big breakthroughs via computer learning and artificial intelligence where we can actually make sense of those. And so these two developments have really made this methylation and these advanced biomarkers now really clinically relevant. And, and a really good example is also as we, we start to talk about this multi-omic platform. Um, so, so obviously genetics was always billed to be a very, very big part of sort of uh, the future of healthcare. And, and I think a lot of people have been a little bit disappointed by that. And, and I think one of the reasons is because there's only one part of the picture. Um, you know, in this now with this multi-omic framework, we can start with genetics uh, and then see what genes are turned on and off via epigenetics and then what RNA is expressed via transcriptomics and what RNA is converted to peptides and proteins via proteomics and then how those those other metabolites in the blood are degraded in terms of metabolomics and how ultimately that correlates to a phenotype for people. And so what we're sort of looking at now is the ability to look at all of these things as one big picture, even adding things like the number of cells or cell morphology into this, as well as things like the microbiome. And it gives us a much, much more complete picture. And we're actually able to analyze this data via those computer learning platforms. And so one of the reasons that methylation is so exciting is it is so robust and it is specific to different cell types. And so what this allows us to do is use these computer learning algorithms to find real really interesting insights that explain the entire picture. Uh, methylation is already a technique which can be used to predict proteomic levels in our blood. It's already been used to predict metabolomic levels in our blood. And as we'll talk about today, it's very, very good at predicting phenotypes which might occur, particularly in the field of aging. And so this methylation uh, sort of at one part of epigenetics is a really exciting platform because it can be trained to predict many, many other outcomes and many of these other multi -omes. It can actually even predict even other types of epigenetic profiles, particularly methylation can even predict acetylation. This is a study done uh, sort of at St. Jude's Hospital where they're actually able to train methylation data to predict acetylation as well. So now what you're sort of seeing is that with one broad platform, if we just look at methylation, we can actually get a big picture at all of the other multi-homes, the whole picture of health with just one test. And that's really, really exciting for the future as we can really reduce costs on things like testing and get very, very accurate in our predictive models. And so this is why methylation is becoming so popular. But, but as we sort of talk about that baseline, now you have a sort of a little bit of background of the molecular biochemistry. Um, we really also want to go into its current applications in clinical medicine. And, and really, you can't talk about epigenetic methylation without talking about its biggest, uh, I would say, use in clinical medicine right now now, which is definitely cancer. You know, one big example of this uh, is actually in the liquid biopsy industry. For those of you who don't know, um, liquid biopsies are where we can take one small sample of blood and, and actually be able to, to predict multiple types of cancers, even at stage zero. Some of you might be familiar with things like IV gene or Oncoblot, or even the, the newest, I say, company who, who is actually Grail Therapeutics, who just released uh, last week a 27 um, stage single test for cancer prediction. Right now it's still a cash pay test, but it actually can predict uh, cancer at stage zero and, and up to 27 different types of cancers with just a single blood test. Um, and I think this goes to tell you just a little bit more about how methylation is also so specific for outcomes. Um, what they're measuring is cell-free DNA methylation. So taking DNA from the blood and looking at the methylation uh, beta values, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and being able to not just predict if you have cancer, but what type of cancer you have and what stage it might be at. Um, and so it goes to show you sort of the level of precision. Uh, you know, this liquid biopsy market is, is massively growing. It's already a multi-billion dollar market um, and will continue to increase year over year. And so this is absolutely something that if you're not aware of in clinical practice, you should definitely consider. And Grail's test, as I mentioned, just launched last week and uh, has garnered quite a bit of attention. So, so hopefully that sort of starts to, to sort of train you to think about uh, maybe all the different applications of methylation as a diagnostic. Um, but methylation is, is beyond even just a diagnostic at this point. Um, it's also used as a prognosis marker for certain types of cancers, where they might actually not just take a liquid biopsy, but an actual biopsy of tumor cancer cells. Um, and with that, they can do an epigenetic analysis to see exactly how to treat it or to grade prognosis. Some people with a poor prognosis might receive much more aggressive treatment. So it's not just a, a predictive marker for if you have cancer, but it's also a predictive marker for how approach treatment. And beyond that, there are more and more drugs every day which are being improved that have an epigenetic mechanism of action, things that might you know, add marks of 
methylation to certain loci in the DNA to, to affect expression. Or we might remove some of these epigenetic marks such as acetylation or methylation to, to affect the DNA and, and reverse cancer as well. And so uh, you have epigenetic cancer diagnostics, you have ep epigenetic prognosis diagnostics, and you even have a whole suite of development of FDA approved epigenetic drugs. And so cancer is by far one of the, the biggest areas for this, uh, but it's expanding rapidly to other areas as well. Probably most notably of which is, is the area of longevity, which is really what True Diagnostic and my company specializes in. And so for the remainder of this talk, what we really will go over is uh, how it's affecting longevity. For, for those of you who, who are not living in this longevity space on a day-to-day -day basis with some of your patients, there is actually a really big change in philosophy about longevity and age where many, many different people now are, are starting to accept aging as a disease in and of itself, not just a result of disease. Um, and, and so this is a really exciting movement. Um, and there's a lot of reasons to think that this is, is uh, rational to do in a medical context. And actually, even the World Health Organization has added now age as an extension code to their ICD ICD-10 diagnosis codes. And so uh, there's definitely a change in the zeitgeist where aging itself is being considered as a disease and one that we can actually treat. And, and this makes sense because aging is and has always been the number one risk factor for the large majority of chronic disease and death. Um, you know, 80% of adults at age 65 have at least one chronic di uh, di di disease diagnosis. Um, in addition to that, the, uh, the life expectancy of, of everyone in the U.S. is actually going down now for the first time in a long time. Um, in addition to that, 70% of all cancers occur uh, in 65 and up, and 82% of people who die from coronary heart disease are 65 and above. And you might think that this is relatively intuitive, but, but it's really uh, a major correlation, one that we've never really explored any further than chronologic age. Um, and, and so uh, so this is definitely what's leading this change as a philosophy is the large correlation between aging and disease. And so the question of if aging is this big of a problem, how do we go about treating it and how do we go about measuring it? You know, there's a really great quote that says, you can't manage what you can't measure. That, that's a really good point. We've traditionally been measuring chronological age just by the amount of years that we've lived. However, everyone here probably knows someone in their 70s or 80s who looks like they're in their 60s or 50s. And everyone probably knows the opposite, where someone who's very, very young typically has a much older phenotype. And so th this phenotypic variation that occurs from individuals of even the same age, it sort of shows how chronological age is a little bit of an outdated mechanism to think about aging. And so what we really need and what has been a search for a long, long time is for a more objective classification of aging and a, and a different way to quantify it. Um, and, and so this, this has been, uh, you know, looked at for a long, long time. Even in the 50s, biological age was calculated as sort of your chronological age plus one year for the number of packs a day you've smoked. Really, really crude measurements. However, in 1988, the American Federation of Aging Research put out what would be the best criteria for aging biomarkers. They said it must predict the rate of aging, and so it must sort of tell where someone is on the span of their life. Um, it must be able to monitor a basic biochemical process and not the effects of disease. We wouldn't want some type of disease to confound our, our sort of thought process on or quantification of aging. Um, it must be able to be tested repeatedly without harming the person. And it must be something that works in both animals and humans so that it can be tested in animals before we, we actually move on to humans. And so until 2013, there was really not a great biomarker which was able to satisfy all of these different requirements. Probably the one that you are most familiar with, which is sort of a surrogate marker for, for aging, has always been telomere testing. Um, and so there are a lot of companies out there that do telomere testing and, and still do. And, and it is one of those hallmarks of aging. So it is definitely an important measurement. But unfortunately, it didn't have a high correlation to age. And, and it left a lot to be desired in terms of being able to predict the outcomes. Oftentimes, people with short telomere lengths uh, don't necessarily develop disease and, and vice versa. People with, with really great telomere lengths don't necessarily uh, stay healthy forever. And so it was wasn't a great predictive test and it's not highly correlated to age, but it really was the best thing that we had. However, in, since uh, 2013, this is when the first aging algorithms were created. And, and in this comparison, uh, there are a lot of people who have sort of compared this type of epigenetic age markers to telomeres. And what they've sort of found is that, that in this sort of review is that briefly telomere length is extensively validated, but has low predictive power. Some of the same narratives we were already talking about. However, in this same review, they actually did a comparison of hazard ratios and, pr and predictive ratios 
ratios. And what they saw is the most predictive and most validated test was up here on that top right, which is these epigenetic clocks. Additionally, you might see on that bottom right that there's actually one composite biomarker, which even has a little bit of a better hazard ratio. Um, and that's actually this, this study called the Dunedin POAM uh, study, which uh, was a composite biomarker of 19 different aging related biomarkers. And that actually now has also been turned into an epigenetic clock, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So what you can start to see is that if you're really looking to predict outcomes, epigenetic measurements are really, really great, particularly for these age-related phenotypes. Um, and so it's really changed the way that we think about these quantifiable objective measurements of age and how we can actually treat age in our patients. You know, if, if everyone in the world were to reverse their epigenetic age by seven years, you would cut disease in half. 50% of people would no longer be sick. In addition to that, if you were to slow the aging rate just by 20% in the United States, you would essentially cut uh, over $3 trillion in entitlement spending by the US government, which is, uh, again, it's hopefully major statistics to just let you know if we can treat and quantify aging, then we can make a major impact on the health of, of population levels, but also of individual patients um, and, and even you and I. So, uh, so this is really, really exciting. And so as a result, what, what is the best measurement for, for biological age now? The answer is epigenetic biological aging. And so whenever we do these tests, um, what we essentially get as an output is an age. So for instance, if someone is, is 35, we might get an age of 36 or 31. There's a wide variation of this based on lifestyle and, and sort of the overall picture of health. Um, there are a lot of things that are correlated to better and worse epigenetic ages. The, the first ever algorithms came out in 2000, 2013. One was done by Dr. Horvath of UCLA, and the other one was done by Dr. Greg Hannum um, from the University of San Diego. And immediately, these were really, really exciting things. They were immediately adopted into things like uh, forensic testing to see how, how old someone was at a crime scene. Um, and they were even used uh, to date refugees to see if they were minors or adults and therefore eligible for asylum. And so what this output is, is essentially an age. And this age is highly correlative of, of, of all of those outcomes which are already correlated to age, particularly all of this chronic disease and death. And so what we can use is, is an, this is an objective biomarker to say where you're at across your lifespan and also to look at individual risk. But before we get into maybe an, analyzing some of these epigenetic markers and how to use biological age clinically, I think it's also very important to go into how we actually do this testing. In order to be able to vet some of these therapies, which are done by really complex things like computer learning. It, it definitely is helpful to know what goes into it in order to make the best clinical decision or know what information is actually valuable to you or your patients. Um, and so in order to describe a little bit about what we do, this process is a molecular biology process where essentially what we will do is take a few drops of DNA uh, of blood. Um, so we only need really three drops of blood in order to do our analysis. And what we will do is we'll essentially extract that DNA and then do something called a bisulfate conversion, which essentially lets us uh, see where methylation occurs. And then we really do a lot of different things to complex these to bead chips. And so what we're essentially doing is measuring if something is methylated or not. We're essentially getting a binary reading. And, but however, we're testing multiple, multiple copies of DNA. And so what we're essentially getting is, is an average of all of those different methylation readings. Um, and so what we get is a number between zero and one. And that is the number that we actually use and interpret in these algorithms to some type of clinical output, which is understandable. And so this is what this would typically look at. And, and what we're measuring at True Diagnostic and what is sort of the standard of the, the clinical literature and research literature is looking at right around 860,000 different different spots in the DNA. Um, and so that's what we're doing. And each of these spots, what we're really hoping for is what is here on the top right, or which is called a beta value, as I mentioned earlier. And this beta value is a percentage of methylation. So it really is able to, to summarize all the different copies of DNA we test, how much of that is methylated at a particular gene location. Um, and so we, we, these numbers are always between zero and one with if numbers toward one being very highly methylated or consistently methylated and, and numbers obviously closer to zero being less methylated and therefore more active or more transcribed. And so we still have the same problem of once we have these values, how do we know what to do with it? And, and in order to sort of give an example of what we do with it, I've included this 2013 Horvath clock, um, which I think will someday win the Nobel prize. Um, and, and so this clock, as you can see on, on sort of line three, this is the algorithm we're actually using to, to turn all these methylation beta values into something which is understandable, this output of age. Um, and so we actually multiply all these beta values by coefficients at 353 spots in the DNA to come up with this ultimate age. And, and that is what is very clinically useful because it gives us an idea if we're aging more rapidly or we're aging less rapidly than our chronological age.
And so these algorithms are, are, are I want to make a very important distinction between the algorithms and the methylation itself. Um, almost anyone can get the data. However, in order for it to be clinically relevant, you really have to create an algorithm to understand that data. And there are multiple algorithms out there. Um, however, it, it's really important to know that, that it, whenever you're trying to decide on how to use this clinically, you really want to vet the algorithm itself, because that is actually the thing that interprets those values into something that's actually clinically useful. And so now that you know a little bit about how that methylation value has actually occurred, it's also important to know that this is completely objective, right? We're doing something that's molecular based, meaning that uh, we could have no information about an individual patient, at all, individual patient at all, and still come up with all of these different phenotypes. And so, as I mentioned, this was originally started in 2013. These first algorithms were created, and they were really, really exciting for one reason. One is that they worked in almost every type of tissue. Additionally to that, they worked in almost every mammal. And so that's started to give an idea that this wasn't something that was correlated to age, but actually might be a causal factor in age. So, so not just necessarily a biomarker to relate to aging, but maybe a biomarker that is causing aging. And that's why I think that this is probably uh, notable in, 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 in discussion for a Nobel Prize. And so uh, Dr. Horvath has definitely been leading the way in UCLA for the majority of these developments. And, and he's had several iterations of these clocks. In 2013, they actually created all these beta, the, these methylation values and trained it against large data sets like the Frampton Heart Study against things like chronologic age. And, and that was a really, really great way to predict chronological age, but it wasn't great in a clinical setting. In 2015 and 2018, that got a little bit better because these computer algorithms changed a little bit. Instead of just trying to predict chronological age, what they really started to do was be able to predict outcomes of health. So particularly if someone was likely to get a disease, what type of morbidity that would be. And then also in 2018, he created an algorithm called GrimAge, which was actually able to even predict lifespan and death. Um, and it's already actually being even being used by insurance companies uh, to give you quotes on, on how much you should be spending for life insurance. And so this is a, sort of the start of a very, very uh, sort of science fiction related um, application of a lot of these methylation cofactors. And so if you want to know more about some of the algorithms which have been published to date, here's a really good example. Um, however, I think it's important to really emphasize that the best clocks are not trained against chronological age. They're trained against health covariates because really that's what we want to predict. You know, if we wanted to be able to predict chronological age, we would actually just be looking for chronological age. So, so what we really want instead is a model that can actually predict the outcomes of health and disease and be able to quantify where where someone is on their lifespan by looking at how they age. And so there are a lot of different biological age clocks out there now. Probably the two most noteworthy are actually PhenoAge, which was published by Dr. Morgan Levine, who's now at Yale, but was a former postdoc student of Steve Horvath at UCLA. And then GrimAge, which is that death predictor we mentioned, because they are the best and, and they've been trained to predict some of these health outcomes. Um, and just to give you an idea of how these measurements in chronological age can be interpreted to outcomes, uh, I always like to, to mention this, the predictive power of these measurements in relationship to cancer. Um, as you can see in the second bullet point here, for every one year increase in the difference between chronological and biological epigenetic age. So for instance, if someone was 25 and they had a, a biological age of 27, we would be able to calculate the risk of, of developing cancer within three years and of dying of cancer in the next five years based on their aging risk. So if someone was two years older uh, biologically, they would have a 12% increased risk of developing cancer within three years and a 34% increased risk of uh, dying of cancer in the next five years. And those are some significant risk increases. And the good thing about this epigenetic age measurement is it's correlated to every type of chronic disease. It's correlated not just to cancer, but cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, um, even neurodegeneration diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And so that's really the beauty is that aging actually predisposes us to all of those chronic conditions. And as a result, by us quantifying aging, we can see how much we are increasing our own risk at, at, of those outcomes. Um, but even more than that, these epigenetic changes are reversible. And as a result, we can make interventions in clinical practice, whether it be diet, nutrition, exercise, or medications, which can actually turn back this clock. Um, most notably, there was a study in 2019, September 2019, called the TRIM trial, which was the first ever proof of concept trial to show that with things like metformin, growth hormone, and DHEA, they could actually reverse the epigenetic aging process and therefore uh, reduce the risk of all of these different outcomes. And that was the first ever proof of concept to show we can change our aging rate and we can actually treat aging as a disease.
since the development of some of these aging clocks, there have been a lot of other algorithms which have been created looking at epigenetics. And I'd like to go through some of the ones which are most notable in this aging related field. Um, and would love to start with probably my favorite of all of the epigenetic algorithms, which is the, uh, the Dunedin POAM algorithm. And so this algorithm was developed in combination with three different universities, Duke University, Columbia University, and the University of Otago in New Zealand. And so this study uh, sort of took place uh, with Dr. Moffitt and, and uh, her collaborators at Duke thinking, how can we go ahead and quantify aging? And, and, and so how can we look at this in young patient populations? They thought that it would be great to look at younger patient cohorts. However, they weren't able to get any grants. People at the National Institute of Aging even thought that if they did see variation, um, that was, first off, they thought there would be no variation in young age groups for aging. Um, and if there was variation, it would be insignificant to the disease process. Um, and so despite the feedback from the National Institute of Aging, um, the, these universities still went forward with the process project. Um, and they did so by starting in 1975. And they had a cohort of over a thousand patients that started whenever they were age three in 1975. Um, and every year for, for really even continuing today um, and continuing probably some years beyond today, uh, they've been taking all uh, 19 different age-related biomarkers, everything from leukocyte telomere length to lung functioning to gum disease and brain MRIs. Uh, they've been looking at all of these different factors um, to be able to predict the rate of aging. Um, and and seeing how the rate of aging would affect outcomes for people. And although the National Institute of Aging thought that there would be no correlation between the aging rate in, in young adults and, and predicting outcomes, they were definitely wrong. Um, so, so now uh, as of, uh, there was a newest study on this algorithm published in the beginning of this year in 2021. And this is some of the things that we were able to find out is that there was a huge significant variation in the phenotypes of, of these people due to their rate of aging, even at age three. Um, here you can see on the left, the ten, the, all of these people are computer generated images and they're all the same age, age 45. However, if you look at the left, you can see the 10 slowest aging members of the cohort as designed and quantified by via, via epigenetic measurement. And then you can see on the right, the 10 fastest aging members of the cohort, which goes to show you that the rate of aging, even at age three, can be highly predictive of the outcomes you would have at age 45. And, uh, and it also goes to show you that you age from the inside out. This aging, this progressive loss of function is a process which doesn't just affect your appearance. It also affects your risk of all of those chronic disease and death. And so it just goes to show you how much uh, over the course of 45 years, your rate of aging or aging itself can have an impact on your quality of life, your appearance, and your risk of all of these different health diseases. So this was a really, really exciting study for many, many reasons. But one of the things I really wanna emphasize is that the aging process starts early. So even in 1975, when these patients were three years old, their brain function assessments and their rates of aging as calculated by via epigenetics was actually able to predict their cognitive processing speed at age 45. Um, it was able to predict retinal imaging scans, uh, which are highly correlated to things like autoimmunity disease, uh, diabetes, stroke, um, at age 45. Um, it was able to predict their, their gait speed and how fast they were able to walk and, and many other biomarkers, which goes to show you that aging is not always of recent origin, um, which as we start to think about how to really impact the aging of our patients and, and quantify this process, you know, most people think that, that aging itself uh, is not necessarily a disease, but now we know that accelerated aging absolutely predisposes you to those diseases. And if you can intervene and change that rate of aging, you can avoid some of those health outcomes. And so uh, one of the other things this tells us is we don't have to wait till we're in our 40s or 50s to really start thinking about how we age. It's already decided in some part by the time we're age three. And so the earlier that we take uh, effect, the more that we can treat this as a preventative process, the better everyone will be from a health consequence standpoint. And so uh, when we talk about this, this is a really a lot of great science, but what is the output? So the output of this algorithm is essentially your rate of aging instantaneously. It's a number that tells you how many biological years you are aging per year. So generally, what we would want to see for most people on this algorithm is that they would have a, a, a pace of aging, which is below one, meaning that for every year, they're aging less biologically than they would be chronologically. Um, and so that's sort of the goal, keeping this below one as much as possible. 
the younger you are, the, the easier it is to keep this low. Um, and the, the sooner you also treat aging as a, a disease process, which is to be mitigated, the more, e the easier it is to keep low. If you start to go above one, you actually have a sort of a snowball effect as well, where you start to uh, encounter more epigenetic accumulation of damage, which then leads to faster aging rates. Um, and so we're able to actually quantify this. And this is great for personalized medicine as well. Um, you know, you and I, or everyone else that, that's listening to this lecture might decide to take metformin. Um, however, we all might have different uh, responses to this in terms of our rate of aging. Some people might have accelerated rates of aging. Some people might have decelerated rates of aging. And so what this is able to do is actually be able to treat personalized medicine by, by looking at what diet, what lifestyle interventions, what medications are affecting our rates of aging, and then doing the best we can to keep that low and making the right choices in our life to really slow the aging process, which will then help us age more gracefully and without disease. And so uh, I, I can't uh, talk about this algorithm enough. There's, I could probably spend an hour just on parts of this algorithm. Algorithm. However, uh, I want to talk about the study that was published earlier this year with this algorithm, where the rate of aging was able to predict many, many different health-related outcomes. It was able to predict the ability to balance, as you can see here, um, where they raised, the rate of aging is on the x-axis and, and the balance scores are on the y-axis. And as you can see, the people with faster aging perform significantly worse on being able to balance. The same is true with grip strength, which has traditionally been a, a very good uh, aging-related biomarker. We saw that as well with cognitive decline in terms of IQ, where the people who are aging more rapidly are going to have more cognitive decline. We also, as I mentioned, see this with facial aging, where people who are aging at faster rates are having significant facial aging appearances. Um, and we can even actually see this on MRIs of the brain, where we see with faster aging rates, we have reduced cortical thickness, we have reduced surface area. Um, and these are just some of the phenotypes which are affected by this aging rate. It has an effect on every different process in the body. And again, the sooner we, we can change it, the better. And it's not just on those things as well. Uh, you know, we always like to talk about this statistic as well, which even if you're slightly above one on that rate of aging, you would actually increase your risk of death in the next seven years by 54%. And you would increase, I'm sorry, 56%. And you would increase your risk of development of some type of chronic disease in the next seven years by 54%. So those are really, really huge hazard ratios that are almost more predictive than a lot of the other things that are out there from a molecular diagnostic standpoint. Um, and so, so this is just one algorithm we're able to look at in this whole suite of diagnostic, but there's even a lot more. Um, earlier we talked about, and, and I'll, we, there are also ways to change this, ways have been validated to change this. This is a, a good example of caloric restriction and how it's able to change the rate of aging. Um, however, you know, there are other biomarkers we can tell from this same data set as well. Um, one of the things we already sort of talked about, which was a little bit uh, less intuitive or less informative for clinical practice was telomere length. However, we can actually even measure telomere length via the same data set uh, that we got from looking at the overall biological age or the even POAM rate of aging. Um, and so this is a study by, done by Dr. Horvath, uh, which actually is able to use DNA methylation to predict telomere length. And its correlation to age is actually double that of traditional telomere length measurements. Um, and besides being more highly associated with age, it's also much more predictive of outcomes. It's much more predictive uh, for time to death, time to coronary heart disease, time to congestive heart failure and association with smoking. And so, so even now, uh, you know, telomere length is becoming a little bit more antiquated because biological age can can really be a better measurement of the aging process, but we can actually even predict telomere length and predict those outcomes even better. Um, and so telomere length is something that we would offer in our testing as well. In addition to what we're able to do uh, with aging-related diagnostics, we're also able to do uh, with immune system insights. One of the things that we're actually able to do is to, pr to predict the constituent of cells we're doing, we're testing in an epigenetic analysis. So we're actually able to take the DNA from the blood and tell you what percentage of immune cells you have in your body. We're able to tell you how many natural killer cells, how many lymphocytes, how many granulocytes and basophils. We're actually able to quantify those percentages for you, again, all based off that same data set because we've been trained training these data sets to be predictive via computer learning. And so again, this is a, a something that, that is highly helpful in the aging process as well. Um, immune system age and, and the ability for T cells to do their job have been always highly correlated with aging. And one of the major outputs that we emphasize in our testing is the CD4 to CD8 ratio, which is a really good indicator of how healthy your immune system is. Typically in healthy populations, you'd wanna see that between somewhere between one and three. And if it's usually below that, then that might be indicative of some type of immunosuppression, 
or some type of autoimmune disease. And, and so this is another great clinical biomarker, which again is included uh, just by itself. And obviously the relationship to aging is pretty significant as well. Um, and there have been even some more studies just recently, which, which uh, we're really excited about and working on to quantify even specific immune cell subsets. There was actually a study uh, by Dr. Herskowitz al alma mater, the, the uh, University of uh, California, San Francisco, which showed that invariant natural, natural T cells when activated can actually clear 100% of senescent cells. We're hopefully being able to quantify even some of those specific immune cell ratios to give insight into processes like senescence and, and, and all the different diseases associated with um, high levels of senescence burden. Um, and in addition to that, we're looking at things like CD4 to CD8 uh, uh, senescent T cell measurements to see if someone is going to be a good candidate for senolytic therapies like rapamycin, dasatinib, and quercetin, or thysatin. Um, and so, so this is actually, you know, great insight into your immune system, but it's also great to decide the best clinical treatment and will continue to improve uh, with as the data sets continue to expand. However, it's not just about the algorithms we're able to look at as well. Even information on the actual loci specific reports in the percentage of methylation can be very, very valuable as well. Um, for instance, even if we're just looking at two methylation loci in the blood, so two places in your DNA, we can actually predict diabetes risk seven years earlier than fasting insulin and HbA1c. Um, and, and so we can actually intervene much like we saw with those cancer diagnostics before any other biomarker is able to realize this. Um, and, and so for instance, if we see someone that reads at an increased risk uh, for diabetes based on our testing, we would absolutely recommend some type of intervention, such as diet, lifestyle, or even metformin, a GLP-1, or an SGL-2 inhibitor. So we're absolutely able to even do loci-specific reports much much more similar to the SNP reporting you would get with traditional genomics. We're also able to report out on traits, um, things like smoking history, for instance. We're actually able to look at your DNA methylation and predict how much you've smoked across your entire lifetime. And, and beyond that, this is also one of the most highly correlated variables um, to predicting the aging process and even death. Um, actually, smoking pack years is one of the inputs for, for Dr. Horvath's grim age. Um, and, and getting that smoking years is actually done by an epigenetic analysis, meaning it's completely objective. Um, and, and this has a lot of implications as well. For any of you who have ever taken a, a nicotine test as part of an employment work, now we can actually see how much you've smoked across your entire lifetime. Um, and, and, and again, you get into some health data, um, I would say, conundrums there, but it's really exciting and really sci-fi. Uh, and we can't just do the same for smoking. We can also do it for drinking. We can tell you how much uh, you're currently drinking. Are you drinking a, a mild, moderate, or heavy amount of alcohol? Um, and this also has implications to the aging process as well, as those people who are considered with excessive alcohol or heavy drinkers uh, generally have a 2.2 two two year age acceleration compared to those who don't. And so this is uh, affects the aging process and even drinking can be quantified via these epigenetic measurements. And so what you can slowly start to see is that this epigenetic profile is affecting every area of medicine um, where really it can be trained to predict most outcomes. If we wanted to use it to predict uh, you know, athletic performance, we, we probably almost certainly could uh, if we had enough data and the data had a high enough correlation to the outcome. Um, and so this is why it's so exciting is with one test, we can tell many, many different things. And, and it's also important to mention that pharmacoepigenetics, uh, much like pharmacogenetics, can be a very useful tool in practice. This was a study that was done um, in Sweden, which actually can predict if someone's going to respond with uh, to metformin via an HbA1c decrease, or if they're likely to have side effects. Here with the algorithm, uh, patients were actually be able to predict it if they were going to be 2.5 times more likely to not respond to metformin and up to three times more likely not to tolerate metformin. Um, and so what this can help us do is even decide what medications we want to give a patient uh, before we have any sort of feedback uh, elsewhere. If we see that they do have a high risk for diabetes, um, but they have uh, unfortunately an intolerance to metformin, we might be able to consider things like berberine or diet and lifestyle interventions or a GLP-1 instead of looking at metformin as that first line therapy. And particularly, you you know, I would say exciting to the to the ACAM crowd as well is the ability to look at even the the exposome or or sort of the amount of exposures we've had to different chemicals throughout our lifetime. These different exposures are actually logged in our epigenetics of our DNA, and so we can actually tell you how much chromium, cadmium, and, and you know uh, arsenic you might have been exposed to. Um, and are excited to look at this before and after things like chelation, which I know the next lecture topic uh, uh, will be for ACAM. And so uh, so even those of you who are doing traditional chelation these epigenetic measurements can even tell you information about that. And so I know that I'm sort of running out of time here. So, so I also want to give you some tools to appropriately vet 
epigenetic testing sources because as this becomes a more and more frequently used process, being able to, to sort of validate or, or critically think about which is the best method and how to use it in clinical practice is very, very important. And so one of the first things that I would always encourage you to ask any epigenetic testing provider is what type of sample is being collected. Um, because the majority of these algorithms have been done via computer learning and every different type of cell has a different epigenetic profile, um, insights we learn from blood-based data sets, we can't apply to saliva, we can't apply to urine, we can't apply to skin. It has to be the cell type specific. So if an algorithm has been created in, in, a, a, in blood, you really have to use it by testing blood. Um, and that's really, really important. The other thing that's sort of happening now is, is that uh, many people are offering algorithms which have not been published. And that can be a really, really big problem because uh, as I mentioned, we're not trying to predict chronological age. What we're trying to predict is the onset and risk for these different diseases so that we can intervene and change the outcome and risk. Um, and generally, if an algorithm has not been published, uh, we're not able to, to actually vet it for its scientific accuracy. And so always ask to know which algorithm is being used and the publications behind that algorithm. And and then uh, also, is that algorithm correlated or validated against health outcomes? So for instance, now Dr. Horvath's 2013 age clock has been used uh, you know, for almost a decade. We know a lot about the correlations that occur with that data set. So we know how it's going to advance aging will affect risk of cardiovascular disease or stroke or heart attack, right? We know how those things are, are able to be correlated um, and that data has been published. And so again, look at how those algorithms have been correlated to all of those different disease states. Um, and then lastly, how many CPGs or locations are being tested. And this is important because, you know, as this field grows, much like genetics, we're going to be able to learn a lot of different insights from large scale data. Right now, out of all of those algorithms I talked about, we're still using and looking at less than 2,000 different locations on the DNA, but we're testing almost 900,000, meaning that there's still a lot of information that we can tell you uh, in the future as we get to learn what most of these CPGs are correlated with. And so if you're really looking at data sets, which you want to use in the future, uh, both as a patient and a provider, you really want to look at the platform that is testing the largest amount of DNA. Um, and so those hopefully will help you vet this therapy more in the future. Uh, but, but I also want to just talk real qu really quickly about how you can use some of these algorithms, particularly some of the algorithms that we do in our platform in clinical practice. And so what we, what we offer uh, from an age-related diagnostic standpoint are, are these reports right here. We do this overall true age report, which goes over all the epidemiological correlations and some of the epidemiological recommendations on how to reverse the aging process. Um, we also do the pace of aging report that, or that Dunedin POEM report as well to give you an instant rate of aging. We also do intrinsic and extrinsic age reports. Without going too deep into that, uh, knowing the difference between intrinsic and your extrinsic age is important because the treatments are different for each and the risks are different for each. And as I mentioned, we can also do telomere length as well. In addition to that, we do obviously smoking and drinking reports, as I mentioned, things like diabetes risk and obesity risk, and are coming out with generally a new report every four weeks because the data here is, is, is starting to be published at a rapid scale. Usually there's a new epigenetic report, uh, I should say epigenetic paper published about every two to three days. And so this, this field is rapidly growing and be, being uh, uh, you know, ready to, uh, to, to add insights into how we practice medicine. And then if you do want to do this type of testing with us or any other provider, typically it can be done even outside of the office. You can send a kit directly to the patient or you can even draw blood via a, a phlebotomy services with a purple top EDTA tube. Once you send that to us, we can actually create these results and send them to you and your patient within just two weeks. And we have a whole portal which is able to connect with EMRs. It's be able to help you uh, manage that patient reporting structure and can even give you more recommendations and more updates as they come along. And, and the future is, is very, very bright and will continue to evolve. We're going to be doing things like uh, predicting hypersexual behavior or empathy. Uh, we'll be able to, to tell, as I mentioned, some of those toxic exposures, be able to predict fertility rates, be able to look at, at mitotic rates and, and, mit and semolytic cell uh, efficacy, as well as even skin aging and skin phenotype. And so uh, we're really, really excited about the future. We have over 25 different IRBs. And I know that was a lot of information in a short amount of time, but this is only the beginning of epigenetic testing. And, and for anyone who would like to learn more, I would always welcome them to reach out to True Diagnostic and anyone on our team can help. Um, and, and we even will do uh, some introductory pricing if you want to do this testing yourself to get some experience on how you might uh, start to treat aging in your practice and treat aging as a disease so you can mitigate the effects of aging. Um, and so uh, with that, I hope left enough time for questions and would love to open it up. I know we covered a lot of information, but would love to address any particular questions in any way I can. The first one here is, 
Do you have any thoughts on a Nexen V staining in epigenetics and if it has any correlation with COVID survival rates? Unfortunately, I, I don't know much about the Nexen V staining. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would love to look into that, but I, but I don't know. I will tell you, though, that, that we're actually about to publish an epigenetic study with Cornell looking at longitudinal uh, changes in, in epigenetic profiles and methylation profiles. And, and we've actually found some really interesting insight that won't bury the lead for the publication. But I will say uh, that there are, are definitely some um, locations which are indicative of COVID exposure and even that COVID long hauler syndrome. And so now that we have a way to actually actually quantify even that COVID long hauler symptom from an epigenetic perspective, we hopefully will be able to now learn more about interventions. We can change that. Um, and, and actually, we can even predict risk of severity with COVID via the same epigenetic profile. And so we actually hope to publish that in Frontiers um, within hopefully the, the next few weeks. Can a regular blood test give out clues about methylation? So definitely clues. You know, as I mentioned, um, the methylation uh, beta values we have in our cells can oftentimes be related to things like, um, you know, our homocysteine levels or our MTHFR. However, it won't actually tell us uh, any information which can be used in these algorithms. Um, the one, one caveat to that is Morgan Levine's PhenoAge, which was one of those first algorithms ever trained against um, health-related outputs instead of chronologic age. And, and, and Morgan Levine actually created a phenotypic score based on 10 age-related biomarkers, which can give you a relative approximate of, of your biological age with just those 10 blood-based biomarkers. And so, so, so generally, I would say that is the only uh, synergy and correlation between the two. But uh, if you'd like to do that, even with the blood markers you have on yourself, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we'll let you know exactly how to do that. What was the name of the study that includes metformin, DHEA, and what was the other drug or supplement? Yeah, definitely. So the the, the study which uh, which I talked about, which is metformin growth hormone DHA, was called the TRIM trial, which uh, which stood stood for essentially thymic rejuvenation, immunorestoration, and insulin mitigation. The idea was that they would use growth hormone to regenerate the thymus and use metformin and DHEA to mitigate the effects of insulin sensitivity that might happen as a result of growth hormone. Unfortunately, it was only had nine patients um, in the study, uh, all men who were over the age of fifty. But it was, as I mentioned, really exciting because it was the first ever proof of concept. We've learned a little bit more about some of those ingredients. And actually right now, the Trim X trial, which is including 50 patients, is currently ongoing uh, with Dr. Horvath and Dr. Fahey from UCLA. How much is the test and how can I order for myself? Is it covered by insurance? So unfortunately, this is not covered by insurance. Uh, we, 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 unfortunately, there's not a pathway the FDA recognizes for methylation-related diagnostics. That's how new this is. However, you will definitely, I imagine, start to see many of these epigenetic tests start to be covered by insurance, starting with maybe even that GRL test uh, I mentioned for cancer. So unfortunately, right now, we traditionally will offer this testing uh, platform for $300 to the provider. Um, some algorithms, which we license out from places like Duke, might have additional charges, but generally, we would recommend recommend this testing to be done once or twice per year, really no more than that. And that would be a cash pay price of right around $300 to most practitioners. Why don't you combine this test with SNP analysis? And also, do you measure DNMT activity? Yeah, so unfortunately, we don't measure DNA, uh, DNA methyltransferase activity. And, and the reason being is that we're not looking at a sort of mRNA transcription. We're just looking at epigenetic methylation. Um, and, and that in and of itself is, is uh, you know, a very expensive and robust process. And, and actually, we actually do look at some SNPs as well. We're actually able to tell you right around 50 to 60 SNPs in terms of what we do per test. Um, but the whole pathway is a different workflow, unfortunately, because what we have to do to the DNA, we have to do that bisulfate conversion, which I mentioned earlier, which, which unfortunately, uh, I would say prevents us from making a lot of calls necessary to get the necessary uh, SNP data. However, we do, there is some information we can learn from that basic underlying genetic principles. And in many of the studies which have been done on epigenetics, look at these genome-wide association studies, which compare the epigenetic methylation to the baseline genomics. And so there is a lot of insight there that, that's helpful. Uh, you know, even, even insight we know in aging, for instance, women with a 677 MTHFR CC variant, can, can actually have higher epigenetic ages, which can be almost immediately changed via supplementation with folic acid or, or uh, methyl uh, folate. And so there are some things that we know about that in those studies, but unfortunately, we don't read those as an output because we don't use those SNPs in the majority of our algorithms to translate that information into clinically useful information. A question here, are there any privacy protection measures? So definitely a good question. And, 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 and 
we have taken a very hard stance of that with our company, uh, which is that we consider the data that we have completely owned by you and uh, we keep it completely de-identified in our system. Um, and so it's not necessarily linked to your name it, besides the PDFs that we report, which is also why we've chosen this PDF reporting infrastructure is to keep those things completely unlinked in our system. Um, however, this will continue to evolve from a privacy standpoint. As I mentioned, it's already being used in insurance. It's already being used in, in uh, forensics. And so it is definitely something at the top of our minds. And, and we have a lot of privacy protection measures. We're SOC 2 compliant um, to make sure that there's no potential data leaks. And uh, we would never share this any information with any other companies or outside sources. So First, I want to thank Ryan again for giving us a two hour lecture in an hour. <laughs> we normally do. Uh, so thank you for that. It's an enormous amount of data. And I know I'm looking for um, sort of partners in with expertise in, in longevity and aging because the, the field is exploding and no one can, can sort of tackle the entire set of data that's coming out. So unless you're an expert in all the new terminology, AMPK, mTOR, senescence, exposomes, multiomics, autophagy, inflammasomes, et cetera, et cetera. We're looking for people to, to analyze certain unique types of patients that we know and, 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 and wanted to learn more about. So uh, I have uh, this report on this 29 year old that ended up to be 25. And I explained to her that you know, that's good. That's great news. But now the, the estimation when you're 60, you're going to be actually 49 from that because that's the, the calculation that you come up with it really depends on a roadmap. And unless you can develop that roadmap with us together, with providers together, you're not going to understand whether you're going to accelerate or decelerate further. I mean, you just need conceptually to have a, even a legend to reach your, to read your roadmap. So it gets really highly complicated. And I have to say that when we call your company, they, they answer. And um, there, there are always questions because I could say that this report, I think, is around six weeks old and um, new reports that came in look different already. So you're, you're accumulating data at a very, 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 very fast rate. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is when I did pathology, uh, we studied centenarians um, uh, in the basement. We noted that they die exactly of the same pathology with the same microscopy and electron microscopy as people in their 70s. They just delay it by 25 years uh, or 30 years. So, and then when you study the genomics, which are better studied than their epigenetics, um, you know, you realize certain pathways are involved. And guess what? Those pathways are being studied in your test. So these are the things that are modifiable. These are things that give me a lot of confidence that we can delay normal degenerative processes that we all have the tendency to be born with. Uh, particularly with the toxic exposure. So all the help we can get, I think is important. The test is, I think, relatively inexpensive for the amount of data it can use. And, and I think that just like the photo shows people that look young and they are younger and people that you could predict that age three is remarkable, but, and people that look older are, are uh, epigenetically older, you, you can keep yourself in a youthful state based on markers that should be marked, I think, I, I, I think you said twice a year or once or twice a year. I think that's outstanding because people who feel good should understand what that looks like versus when they don't feel good. So that's even relevant for people that you've treated for Lyme and now they feel good. Well, mark it and say, if you're close to that, you're probably doing the, the best possible job for yourself. So you have any comments to that? Well, you know, I, I would I would say that at first of all, I agree with everything there. Um, you know, I think that one of the big overarching things that we've learned since the advent of this testing in 2013, as we start to quantify aging, is that the majority of things that would improve these metrics are relatively intuitive. Um, you know, the things that you think will help. So improving things like Lyme, reducing inflammation, you know, having a more natural diet, all of those things are correlated with better aging rates. And so uh, a lot of the things that we know now are relatively 
relatively intuitive, but the next wave of breakthroughs are going to be, you know, I would say very, very insightful on an individual and patient specific basis, which will hopefully give us all a lot more tools to make more personalized recommendations. And so this is still very new, but it is growing at a rapid pace. And so uh, we, we definitely need those collaborators, especially from a physician standpoint, to give us more of that feedback so we can create more insights and really drive this field forward. And so uh, I appreciate everyone listening and, and I appreciate uh, your help, uh, Dr. Squiz, as well. Thank you so much for that presentation, Ryan. It was a wonderful lecture. Thanks, Dr. Herxowitz, for moderating, of course. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye. Have a good evening, everyone.